Well, welcome uh, everyone uh, to uh, this event uh, in the uh, Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies Global Public Law Seminar Series. Uh, a particular welcome to our panelists, Nicholas Aroni, Ava Maria Belsa, Peter Nielsen and Asanga Welakala. Uh, and an even more particular welcome for Stephen Tierney, whose book is the focus of discussion for this event and who in effect is the guest of honour. So let me begin by acknowledging the Boon Mwurrung, Mwurrung people, the trust, traditional custodians of the land from which I'm presently speaking. And I also pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, of the Kulin Nation. I extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians participating in this seminar uh, today. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met, I'm Cheryl Saunders and I will be chairing the seminar uh, today. Now this seminar is the occasion for an Australian launch of the, this important new work, work of constitutional theory by Stephen Tierney entitled The Federal Contract. And we're very grateful to Stephen for agreeing to allow the book uh, to be launched here. Even more importantly, the seminar is an opportunity to engage with the ideas in the book. These have tremendous salience in Australia, and they're also potentially relevant for many countries that have or seek territorial plural, plural, pluralism in any significant form around the world. All of us who work on federal constitutional systems are aware of the inadequacy of constitutional theory developed on the basis of monist assumptions uh, when we're working in a federal context. And this book seeks to fill this gap. Now, I don't want to preempt what our panelists will say, uh, but I'm assuming that the audience won't have read the book. Uh, so let me just say a few words to introduce the subject. This book offers a highly sophisticated and integrated account of federal constitutional theory. To this end, uh, the author engages with the key relevant building blocks of constitutional theory from constituent authority to sovereignty and beyond. In effect, it reconceives them individually and collectively from a federal perspective. Through and on the basis of this careful chain of reasoning, the author argues that the purpose of federal constitutionalism is, and I quote, to establish a constitutional un union that gives foundational recognition and accommodation to a state's constituent territorial pluralism. And that claim for constituent territorial pluralism is a key move to which I'm sure we'll return. It follows that a federal constitution both fosters this pluralism and maintains a constitutional relationship between pluralism and union. The much more familiar resulting tension between pluralism and union uh, can be accommodated in many ways to suit local conditions, consistently with federal constitutional theory as scoped in this work. A range of institutional choices that presently exist are examined in the latter chapters through the prism of four principles of federal constitutionalism, pillars of the concept of federalism for which the author contends. And these are recognition, autonomous government, associational government and reciprocity. Now there's an interesting question about the relationship of constitutional theory to comparative constitutional law. The diversity of constitutional arrangements inevitably means that at least some theories that purport to be universal have more limited explanatory value. This is less of an issue where, as here, theory is not tied to particular institutional arrangements, in fact, on the contrary. Nevertheless, the vast range of circumstances in which federalism falls to be applied and the variety of ways in which such choices have been explained in local context make it useful to explore the work from different comparative perspectives. And this is the rationale for our terrific panel to which I'm about to turn. So we plan to proceed as follows. In a moment, I'll introduce all the four panelists. Each of them will speak in the order in which they're introduced for 10 minutes or so. And at the end of their presentations, I'll introduce Stephen properly and invite him to respond or indeed to say anything else about the book that he wishes. There should then be some time for further exchange between the panelists and the author, and hopefully time permitting for some questions from the audience. And in that case, 
uh, we'll ask you to use the Q&A function. So now let me move uh, to introduce the panel. Nicholas Aroni is Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Queensland and a well-known scholar in comparative constitutional law, legal theory, and comparative federalism. Eva Maria Belsa holds a chair for Constitutional and Administrative Law at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland and is co-director of the Institute of Federalism at that university. She works on Swiss and comparative constitutional law and federalism and has served on international consultancy projects in, for example, the Horn of Africa and Syria. Peter Neeson is Professor of Political Science at the University of Hamburg with a focus on political theory. He's presently directing a project on constituent power beyond the state. And Asanga Wellakala is a public law scholar at the University of Edinburgh, the acting director of the Edinburgh Centre for Public Law and a research fellow of the Center for Policy Alternatives in Sri Lanka. He researches in the fields of comparative constitutional law and applied constitutional theory. Now, there's a great deal more to say about each of our panelists, but uh, that gives you a snapshot and gives you an impression of the, the variety of experiences and the variety of perspectives on federalism uh, they bring to this important discussion. Uh, so uh, for more, we uh, re refer you to the, uh, to the flyer that was uh, sent out by my colleague, Anna. And now let's turn to the panel, uh, beginning with you, Nick. Um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, Cheryl, for the kind introduction and to you and to Anna and everyone else involved for the invitation to speak tonight. It's a real pleasure to do so, especially about Stephen's wonderful book. And the approach I'm going to take is not unlike what Cheryl has done, because I think that the main strength of Stephen's book has to do with its systematic character and its explanatory power. And in fact, my mind turned to many similar things as Cheryl's did by way of introduction, because it seems to me that for a long time, federalism scholars have been bemoaning the lack of theory underlying their discipline. And it seems to me that this has two dimensions. Firstly, as Cheryl pointed out, it is felt that political philosophy and constitutional theory has focused almost exclusively on the foundations of the unitary nation state and has treated federations as unusual cases that are either anomalous or transitional steps towards the path of full statehood. Secondly, it is said that theories of federalism have failed to overcome the dialectic of the universal and the particular. They have been unable to develop a synthetic account of federalism in which the specificities of each particular case can be brought within the explanatory purview of a single general theory. Stephen Tenney's new book, The Federal Contract, offers such a theory, conceived as a work of constitutional theorization rather than a work of empirical political science or normative political philosophy. The essential idea of the book is that federal constitutions are formed through the constituting act of a plurality of territorially defined political communities. Tierney characterizes this constituting act as the federal contract. Although this term is not quite defined in the book, the idea is that federal constitutions are created when a plurality of distinct political communities agree to form a federated political community, creating a polity of polities or a state of states, or a community of communities. At the heart of the political, of the federal contract, therefore, is the need, Stephen points out, to balance the dynamic tension between pluralism and union that characterizes the federal idea. He argues that it can be adapted to meet the needs of a wide array of social, economic, and political conditions. And this explains why there has been so much variety among federal systems. Nonetheless, it is Stephen's thesis that this institutional variety can be explained in terms of the fund fundamental concept of the federal contract. And at the core of the federal contract, he argues, is a particular legal normative purpose that unifies all polities that fall within this special genus of constitutional system. As such, the federal contract is an alternative to the social contract of modern political theory. Rather than presupposing a uni unitary demos or people, the federal contract 
presupposes a plurality of demoi. The constitutional theory of the federal contract accordingly involves an alternative account of many of the most fundamental concepts of modern constitutionalism. Instead of constituent power being located in a single people, the constituent foundations are a plurality of peoples. Instead of sovereignty being concentrated in a centralized set of political institutions, political power is distributed among a plurality. Instead of the individual citizen being the sole locus of constitutional rights, federal constitutions are predicated on a plurality of territorial subjects, which possess fundamental rights themselves to local self-government. Stephen does not propose that these elements displace the other fundamentals of modern constitutional government, but he does propose that federal constitutions accommodate these pluralized elements and that they involve certain important qualifications of what are widely understood to be the essentials of modern liberal democratic and constitutional government. This leads to a certain normativity in his account that I think is under the surface. Modern liberalism, which conceives the state as being composed ultimately of individuals, often finds federalism to be incomprehensible or at best considers it to be a means to achieve liberal political goals and not as a normative structure of government that is in itself morally or politically desirable. Stephen ably demonstrates how this common foundational logic of the federal contract informs each of the differing institutional manifestations that we find in federal systems. He does this by focusing on an array of key constitutional ideas as Cheryl pointed out. The first of these concerns the foundation of the constitution, of the constitution in an act of constituent power. Against the prevailing monist conception, Stephen maintains that the federal, that federal constitutionalism attributes the legitimacy of the constitution to a plurality of peoples territorially organized. And he argues that this sets federalism on an entirely discrete legal normative path. Such a conceptualization might be thought to imply that there is no significant difference between a federal state and a confederation of ind independent states. However, Stephen argues that the Gordian knot can be untied by distinguishing between the unity of the federal state as a state conceived externally as a category of international law from the plurality that's embedded within a federal constitution domestically conceived as an internal category of domestic law. Stephen shows how this plurality was fundamental to the making of the United States Constitution, notwithstanding its framing in terms of the nationalist narrative advanced by James Madison and Alexander Hamilton as the primary authors of the Federalist Papers. He also shows how the Canadian Constitution has become increasingly federalized in the context of its deep territorial and cultural cleavages focused on the province of Quebec. Now, if I may be permitted some very small quibbles at this point, I think it would have been illuminating to have explored in more depth the constituent fundamentals of several other federations, noting that some attribute of constituent power to a, that some attribute constituent power to a plurality, others to the people as an undifferentiated whole, and others to some combination of these. Stephen certainly traverses this, but I think there's a lot of detail to be. Um, looked at and analysed across the various federal states across the world. Also, in relation to the United States specifically, I wondered if more light might have been shed on the making of the Constitution by giving a little more attention to the anti-federalists and the proponents of the New Jersey plan within the Philadelphia Convention, which is discussed in a footnote and briefly in a few places. Similarly, I thought missing was a substantial discussion of the conceptions of federalism that lay behind the American Civil War. And St. George Tucker and especially John C. Calhoun, I felt were conspicuously missing maybe. But those are very, very minor points, very minor indeed. Um, Stephen turns then to the purpose and principles of federalism. The purpose of federalism, he says, is to recognize and accommodate constitutionally the state's constituent territorial pluralism and to maintain a constitutional relationship between pluralism and union through the establishment of different orders of government at a state and federal level. That's to use my words. The twin pillars of pluralism and union, he argues, are secured through four, the four principles Cheryl has mentioned, recognition, autonomy, association, and reciprocity. What do these mean? 
The formation of the federal constitution, he says, involves recognition of the authority of the constitution and of the federal order that it establishes and of the constitutional status of the constituent states along with the institutions of the federal government. It also involves constitutional maintenance of the autonomous capacity of the constituent states to engage in their own self-government, but in a way that always also acknowledges the formation of a federal order of government with its own autonomous institutions. Accordingly, the constituent states are also given a role in the governance of the Federation as a whole, conceived as a form of associational or cooperative rule. And finally, in this context, the federal commitment to maintaining both unity and plurality requires a principle of mutual reciprocity, both between the state and federal governments and among the, and among the state governments themselves, a commitment that underwrites intergovernmental cooperation and so solidarity, while also maintaining intergovernmental distinctiveness and autonomy. Stephen emphasizes that while these are fundamental principles of the federal contract, their particular instantiation will vary from place to place and from time to time. There are many various ways in which these principles are manifest in institutional designs and competence allocations, which themselves can be symmetrical or asymmetrical across several dimensions. In two very detailed chapters, Stephen shows how this has worked out in specific constitutional systems. These chapters traverse what are often regarded as the meat and bread of federal systems, such as the distribution of powers and the construction of governing institutions. Stephen seeks to demonstrate that despite the institutional variability, they all recognize the need to balance the dynamic tension between pluralism and union. Finally, Stephen turns to the dynamics of federal systems understood, understood in terms of formal constitutional amendment, as well as the sorts of changes that occur through social, economic and political change and the decisions of courts vested with constitutional jurisdiction. He shows how these two are responsible or responsive to the underlying purpose and principles of federations in terms of the need to maintain some sort of equilibrium between unity and plurality. So in conclusion, it seems to me that the explanatory power of Stephen's thesis is impressive. The basic concept is simple and elegant. The idea of a federal contract as a constitutional arrangement under which a plurality of territorial polities are formed into a federal polity of which they are its essential constituents. The central purpose of the federal constitution is therefore to maintain both unity and plurality through what Stephen calls recognition, autonomous government, associational government, and vertical and horizontal reciprocity. These principles, he argues, flow logically from the meta purpose of federalism. They are features of all federal systems, although their specific constitutionalization varies significantly depending on the specifics of particular times and places. And in some cases, federal systems, they do persist through, ad through an adaptation to challenges, but in other cases, they can collapse because a sufficiently stable equilibrium between unity and plurality cannot be maintained. To my eye, federal constitutions are somewhat like the fractal patterns of mathematical geometry, insofar as they reflect a particular federating logic which drives their initial creation and ongoing evolution. The striking thing about fractal patterns is that a relatively simple formula can generate geometrical patterns that are highly intricate and complex and also very beautiful. In these representations, the patterns are replicated recursively on smaller and smaller scales, but not necessarily identically, making them appear organic rather than mechanical. Federal constitutions, of course, are not anywhere nearly as neat and tidy as fractals, but they do seem to have a fractal-like quality. It seems to me that one very important area of research that Stephen's book opens up is an ever closer examination of the specifics of federal systems to see whether the patterns he has identified continue to be apparent as the microscope is applied at higher and higher levels of magnification. My sense is that they are. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Nick. And very uh, nice note on which to, to end because I, I do think that this is the beginning of a conversation rather than the end that we're having here tonight. Eva Maria, lovely to see you. I'm glad your camera's fixed. <laughs> uh, would you be happy to intervene now? Yes, thank you very much, Jerome. Um, 
Hello everyone, I'm very pleased and honored to participate in that global public seminar on the federal contract. I'd like to start by congratulating its author. Uh, the federal contract is a highly relevant and in a way a, a radical book. It is a rich and inspiring contribution about the real essence of federalism and the consequences of these essence for federal constitutions and their understanding. It truly paves the way for a radically new way to look at federations in theory and in practice. But it is really even more than that. It is a highly valuable contribution to constitutional theory more generally. By presenting that new theoretical framework for federal states, the book in truth also presents a new or a newly thought theoretical framework for unitary states as well. But the new theoretical framework for federalism is at its core, and it is the focus on our panel. So I'd like to briefly raise uh, five points. Um, the first is that the book responds to a well-known conundrum. Federalism is very persuasive in theory and practice, as we all know. The number of unitary states is decreasing, the number of federal states is increasing. And it is hard to see how countries such as Iraq or Syria, Ukraine or Russia, Sri Lanka or Myanmar could stabilize, develop and implement human rights for all without adopting, implementing or reviving federalism. But why has federalism remained so poorly understood? Why has it been so strangely neglected by constitutional theory? Stephen Tinney's books not only paves the way to better understanding federalism, it also explains that conundrum and contributes to solving it. He powerfully reminds us that constitutional theory has been and still is dominated by demotic monism, a people, a fictive pouvoir constituant, making a constitution, transforming it into a pouvoir constitué and legitimizing authority. Federations are radically different. They have a fundamentally different purpose, the purpose of recognizing and accommodating pluralism within a state. In federations, there is no people, there are peoples with the will to be and remain plural. Well, this fundamental difference of constitutional purpose requires a conceptual rerouting of constitutional theory and the way we think about constitutions, constitutional foundations, constitutional authority, sovereignty, and so on. It seems to me that by retracing constitutional history and constitutional theory and always drawing our attention to their monist bias, um, the book really solves the conundrum. We have not been able to fully grasp federalism because it has been limited or caught into two approaches, one being a descriptive approach, the other one being a prescriptive approach. Well, the author reminds us that Federalism is not an exotic outlier to normal constitutionalism. It is a form of constitutionalism of its own in its own right, a radical alternative to unitary constitutionalism. And if we agree with this, most, if not all, constitutional concepts must be recalibrated to do justice to federalism. And Tierney's book shows us how this can be done and must be done. So it's my aim and achievement, I think, is to free federalism from its institutional and its ideological baggage, and I would add, from its colonial baggage too. That brings me to my second point, the very essence of federalism. I think there must be something Scottish about it, because so far two people have really explained that very essence to me, and both are Scottish. The second is Stephen, the first is Jenny Geddes. Jenny Geddes, for those who do not uh, know, my personal hero of federalism was a market trader in Edinburgh. Her Sunday job was to sit in Edinburgh's St. Giles Cathedral very early in the morning and reserve a prominent seat in church for a prominent person paying for such service. 
while waiting, she sat on a stool. And in 1637, she famously threw that stool at the head of the minister. And by doing so, sparked riots that later led to the English Civil War. And why did she do it? It was because she was so angry about the use of the Book of Common Prayers in Scotland. Until then, the Scottish Church had used its own Book of Prayer. But in the 1630s, King George I wanted the Scots to uh, follow Anglican-style church services. And when that common Book of Prayer was first used, Jenny Cheddis threw her stool. And that's when the tumult started. So federalism is radical. And I'm very grateful to Stephen Tierney for having reminded us of that. And it is all about dealing with territorial pluralism, a pluralism which can relate to church services, but most often relates to other political, economic, social, and cultural markers of identity. Tierney, Main's thesis is, and I fully agree, that we fail to understand federalism if we do not start and end here. Federalism is a constitutional, permanent quest for territorial pluralism. And that brings me to my third point, the making of federations. Most of us have felt it, but have never been able to pin it down. Constitutional theory does not really work for federations. It is based on the monist concept of the constituent power and on people composed of individuals as Nick has just reminded or recalled. In federations, the entity transformed is not simply the people, it's, it's a more complex entity, it's a plural entity. Territories which agree on a treaty, a fides, to form or to maintain a union while at the same time pre preserve, recognize and accommodate plurality. As we know, the accommodation of diversity is only half of the truth. Federalism is just as much about unity, its establishment and its role, uh, which is limited by pluralism. So the essence of federalism is really about both, to maintain and foster territorial pluralism and to maintain and foster union between the territories and their governments as well. It is not about the never perfect or ever closer union, but about the flourishing of difference. It's not about disintegration either, but about the flourishing of unity as well. So the question really is how to keep the balance at the beginning and as the Federation lives on and who decides on the right balance and on whose behalf. The author's thoughts on these issues, I think, are highly enlightening. But I want to come to my next point, the broadness of federalism. Federalism is a distinct species of constitutional government, but it's a very broad species. And I wonder here whether the approach chosen is broad enough. Stephen claims that the federal constitutional moment is the union of territories. It is the union which gives federalism its initial, initial and, and thereafter path determining orientation. The making of the federation transforms territorial constituent units into subjects with discrete governments. I can easily agree in the case of aggregation then the federal contract transforms subjects with full constitutional powers into subjects with limited powers. The constitution creates and expresses a bond uniting and differentiating founding territories and the constitutional authority created by these territories. Now the author grants that these territories might not have a discrete constitutional existence at this foundational moment. But by making the federal contract these territories become foundational subjects. Well, I wonder whether this is broad enough. I mean, Nepal, for instance, adopted the federal constitution without agreeing on territories, which remained controversial for a very long time. And who are the constituent territories in countries such as Iraq, 
in Syria, in Sri Lanka, and in, in Ukraine? And how can we deal with highly asymmetric situations in which only one territory really is pre-existing, claims a difference, and insists on pluralism, and the other territories are only carved out as federalism evolves. So the pre-existence of territories is not always a given. Territories are often only made by federal contracts. But then if this is the case, a new conundrum appears. Who are these constituent powers? Who, who are the makers of the federal contract? Is it the Kurds and the Arabs, the Tamils and the Sinhalese, or the existing governorates? That brings me to my um, next and last point, the relevance of territory. Federalism, the author claims, is a foundational recognition that territory matters, and that identity does not necessarily match the borders of the state. I fully agree. The author also claims that federalism allows societal pluralism to flourish. My question is whether we can think that special relationship federal constitutions create and maintain between constituent entities and authority beyond territory. What about other forms of collective pluralism? Can we think the essence of federalism in a way which includes other forms of politically and rele relevant collective identities, other forms of collectivity with governments of their own or the desire for self-determination? I'm not just referring to the linguistic communities of Belgium, but to other ethnic, religious, linguistic communities, peoples or minorities with no clear territorial homeland or, or, which have, or, or entities which have lost their territorial homeland or are disturbed, the, the resettled, um, squatted, urbanized and otherwise territorially blurred, but still have a form of pluralism. Human beings, after all, have identities, not territories, and these identities are multiple and dynamic. Um, the author mentioned that federalism is an antidote to territorial conflict, and I fully agree. But I wonder whether this antidote cannot be understood much more broadly as an antidote to conflicts about pluralism domination of one group or community over the other, an antidote to legacies of homogenization and of cultural assimilation and marginalization, be it territor territorial or not. To come to an end, and uh, that links to what Cheryl just said and Nico as well, one would wish that this book is only the first in a series. Stephen Tierney has uncovered the federal idea and discovered the common foundational logic, but not necessarily practice of federalism. By doing so, he has altered and enriched, enriched the way we think about constitutionalism as well. Now, where do we move from here? What about our understanding of other constitutional concepts? Is it not that we theorize all of these constitutional concepts based on a monolithic people? It is true that federal scholars have been working on federalism and democracy, no doubt. They have praised territories as meaningful settings for democratic politics and federalization as meaningful processes to deepen democracy. But do we really have a theoretic grip of what democratic governance means in the presence and constitutional recognition of several peoples, several demon? And the same goes for the rule of law and human rights. All fields, I believe, which are still surprisingly occult when 
operating in federal settings. So congratulations to the author for having presented the seminal book a new way. And I think it's not the end of the story, but really a new start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ava Maria. Stephen, we look forward to the next six books in the series. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that was that was great. Thank you so much. Uh, Peter, can I uh, pass the baton to you? Yeah, thanks for inviting me to comment on this hugely admirable work, which is built on a single distinctive and much appreciated idea, the idea of federalism as the name for a constitutional union founded upon the foundational significance of territorial pluralism. Uh, from my perspective, one of its main virtues is that it single-handedly rescues a notion of democratic theory for federalism, namely the concept of constituent power. Now, what follows are very preliminary considerations, and I am also not a legal scholar, but a political theorist, so I may bring in the wrong kind or external normative considerations to the table. Also, I look at the theoretical design coming out of a recent research project, as Cheryl has said, on the constituent power of the European Union, which I hope will not produce distortions in our discussions. I should say that I thoroughly sympathize with the two main polemics the book contains, both with regard to more mainstream conceptions of constituent power. First, against what we could call an absorption theory of constituent power, the view that constituent power once exercised and channeled into a written constitution with legal force is then spent and either perpetually neutralized or only capable of being reawakened in extraordinary moments that necessitate the total overhaul of a former totalizing decision. I accept that constituent power is what continues to legitimate federal democratic orders in both its institutionalized and its non-institutionalized understanding. Secondly, I agree that modern constitutionalism would be seriously impoverished without the recognition of federalism as a distinctive type of constitution making and constitutionalism, yielding a distinctive duality of constituent power. And one virtue of the book is presenting federalism as a competitor theory of homogeneous conceptions of constituent power, which seems much needed in the context of ever more complex non-state and, yes, multi-level polities, if I may, beyond the state. Yet I wonder whether what is most distinctive and, in my view, most productive in many current federal systems is not underspecified in the book, namely the combination of federal and unitary elements in the development of democratic constitutions. Now, I want to ask two questions. One regarding the historical as opposed to constructivist character of the federal contract. This picks up some motives that Eva Maria has just introduced. And the other question is about the democratic character of the federal contract itself. First, a lot hangs on facts about constitutional history, given that the actual federal contract gives federal constitutionalism a foothold in reality with indelible normative consequences. And the rhetoric of federal contract, federal moment, federal founding act is a historical and realist one. It is a claim about actual ori origins, not virtual or imagined or reconstructed origins. And in line with what my colleagues in political science call historical institutionalism, it justly stresses the empirical path dependency of developments. On the other hand, constitutional history is often idealized, mystified, or fictitious. And in principle, at least from my perspective, there is no argument against rational reconstructions of constitutional orders, which need not closely correspond to their actual genesis. On the contrary, sometimes constitutions do have this bootstrapping effect that they create the very subject of legitimation they base their validity on. Yet Stephen Tierney's formulation of constitutional foundations contains a necessary empiricist index since foundation concerns, I quote, the establishment of constitutional authority at the moment of constitutional naissance, unquote. 
Now, I wonder if the book itself suggests that there may be counterexamples to the thesis. Despite the focus on path dependency, Flanders and even Catalonia crop up time and again to illustrate typical federal features and problems. On page 16, it says that, quote, the Belgian constitution changed in 1993 to declare the state federal. Not Wallonia, the German speaking province and Flanders struck up an original and new constitutional treaty obliterating the Belgian constitution with its tradition going on, going back to 1831 and founding a new order. In possible contrast, on page 66, it says, an important particularity of the Federal Foundational Act is that the connection between this act and its constituents is always real rather than symbolic. In the context of a spirited critique of the fictitious consent presupposed in monist views of constituent power, it seems surprising that the very existing, its ex existence and boundaries of the territorial units can be the constructivist results of intrastate deliberation, such as in Belgium. I should add immediately that I myself am fine as a matter of methodology with reconstructive allocations of constituent authority that attempt to make best sense of an existing constitution. It seems more difficult to accept cases like Belgium if, like Stephen Tierney, one also has a strong notion of what he calls constitutional identity. This notion enters the pictures, picture in some places in the book, for example, with reference mm -hmm. to the unamendable federal character of Germany. If federal founding can be bootstrapped, as in Belgium, I would prefer to both drop the historicity requirement and the notion of constitutional identity that necessitates making a black and white distinction between constitution making and constitutional change here. Now I come to my second question. This also picks up um, the thread that Eva Maria has already introduced to the discussion. The actors in founding constitutional uh, powers are territories. But do territories come with the correct ontology to found a constitution, for example, agency? Of course, what is great about the language of territories is that they put an arm's length distance between federalism and ideas of nationalism, ethno-cultural identity, or ideas of cultural or linguistic essentialism. So this is all to be welcomed. But territories, and even what Stephen Tierney calls the regional identity they may come with, seem to provide a rather thin basis to motivate internal solidarity and to be underspecified as to the reasons for their recognition. Negatively speaking, as Eva has pointed out, it is clear that in some instances, territorial differentiation may avoid strife or acute civil ethnocultural conflict. And of course, the absence of such conflict is of value. But of course, ethnocultural unity or homogeneity is never proposed in Stephen Tierney's book as a value. And other more universalistic possibilities are ruled out as externally induced from political theory. Now, my own view is that the functional normativity of federal constitutions would have to be spelled out in democratic terms. This raises two questions. The first question is whether territories are neutral vis-a-vis -vis their democratic or autocratic organization. Where territories contract, this seems not to require a democratic makeup of the constituent units and perhaps the federal aspect of the British constitution resting on the act of union stands in the background here and might stand in the way of a democratic requirement here. Does the federal contract make a clear commitment to the democratic organization of its constituent units? Representation may be involved, Tierney argues, but representation is not said to be necessarily democratic. And ascribing original constituent power to the individuals making up the territorial collective is also ruled out. Now, of course, Tierney could object that the potentially non-democratic character of the contracting units does not matter since their constitutional treaty creates a post-constitutional democratic people 
on whose continuing legitimatory practices, the continuing validity of the now democratic, comprehensive state constitution depends. And this is an elegant interpretation of the dualistic character of constitutional validity of federal states, which has a federal and a unitary component, free constitutional pouvoir constituant is the sum of the territories, while the post-constitutional pouvoir constituant in Tierney's discussion of Lachlan and Loughlin and Lindahl is the people. In this productive duality, Tierney's construction incorporates some of the advantages of what has been called pouvoir constituant mixed in the past two or three decades and applied to monstrous polities like the European uh, Union, the combination of two constituent claims by two ontologically heterogeneous subjects. And I'm sure the book will provide a major boon and inspiration to the further explication of pouvoir constituant mixed with its students. However, in closing, I would like to ask whether the federal contract is compatible with ending up with a non-democratic order of government. And I have a specific candidate order in mind, namely the one that is called democracy in discussions about the European Union. In the formulation of Calypso Nicolaidis of governing together, but not as one. It has often been said that federalism has an elective affinity to, to democracy. And Stephen Tierney presents the federal contract throughout as one among a number of, I quote, modern democratic forms of government, unquote. Another quote, what is it about the federal idea that distinguishes federalism from other modern democratic forms of government, unquote? If so, it should be incompatible with democracy, the co-government of constituent collectives, and likewise with the pro project of federations of states that the German tradition has called Bund and fail to provide a credible version of democratic peoplehood, one that institutes a single category of citizenship and belonging and installs political equality among its citizens. I don't see how or why this should be ruled out in Tierney's book. I mean, don't see how or why the possibility of the federal contract being continuous with creating a democracy and not a democratic regime would be incompatible with the federal contracts. There seems to be, I conclude, no necessary connection between the idea of the federal contract and the idea of a single state people, such as in the versions of Lindahl and Lachlan discussed, conferring its authority in practices of constitutional constituent authority on a single egalitarian people. I suspect that this is because the horizontal idea of contracting sits uneasily with the vertical and hierarchical aspect of constitutional law, which necessarily comes with the promise of treating every citizen subject alike. But I am open to being convinced, of course, that behind the federal contract, there lies a stronger conception of democracy as the one that could be realized in a democracy. And I look forward to potential volumes in the series that could address this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, future volumes or not, as this discussion goes on, I'm increasingly wishing we were all sitting around a table and had about two days to uh, really bat these ideas around uh, because such a rich array of interesting ideas, responses, and interesting examples are coming out uh, of this discussion. And quite apart from anything else, what Peter's just said, has wet my curiosity about his other research project. And I look forward to uh, seeing how that pans out uh, in due course. Uh, Asanga, can I turn to you now? Thanks very much, um, Cheryl. Um, thanks to you and to Anna for, and the Melbourne Center for this invitation. I'm delighted to be here and also to um, join the other panelists. Lots have been said, so um, I suppose I can sort of cut down what I was planning to say uh, quite substantially. Uh, lots of things that Nick, you and uh, Eva, and in fact, Peter was in raised also uh, were things that I had um, wanted to flag, uh, but I'm not going to repeat all of that. But I'll stick to sort of 
three broad points um, at a sort of very high level of generality. I've had the good fortune of having read the book almost a year ago when sort of Stephen <laughs> shared his manuscript with me. So I had a great uh, deal of fun last summer reading it and engaging with it at a time when um, we were also dealing with uh, Myanmar, Cheryl. Um, yeah. so, so, so it's been, a, um, uh, I, I've, I've had the benefit of, of, of reflecting on, on Stephen's work for, for quite a while now. Uh, so the three broad, broad points are, uh, the first one is a, a comment about um, Stevens' approach as a constitutional theorist um, to the issue of the federal contract and territorially plural polities. Uh, the second one is about the book and, and its subject in a very um, dramatically changing world of comparative constitutional law that we're living through right now, um, and especially the sort of post-Cold War era is ending and, and we don't know what it might yield in the future, but it's certainly a, a world of flux. Uh, and thirdly, of course, um, I should say something as a um, somebody who, who, who deals with um, practical constitution making and the field uh, as a very substantial part of my work. Um, <clears throat> as, uh, from, the, from the experience of constitution making um, and federal constitution making in the global south, um, what I would uh, say would be the, um, uh, uh, the contribution of the book. Um, and perhaps one of it, it's how one of its strengths is also one of its limitations. Um, I should say, of course, Stephen is a, is a mentor and friend and colleague. So I hope what I'm gonna say is not uh, overtly, um, you know, uh, my objectivity is not overtly uh, affected by that. Um, so first, as an approach, I think uh, Stephen's been talking about this approach that he exemplifies in this book for a very long time, uh, the, the, the constitutional theory, uh, um, the, the, the particular, the distinctive contribution that con constitutional theory can make to the understanding of multi-level governance and, and, and um, multi-level constitutionalism. And there's a again a, a, a kind of distinctive approach that that Stephen is associated with, and which is that um, you are interested with both norms and practice simultaneously, not norms first and then practice to be framed by. It. So, so, so this sort of approach is really, uh, you know, it, to me, it imbues the entire discussion and then the, the flavor and tone of the book, uh, where norms are framed by the actual the actuality. Um, the, 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 the real practice and not the other way around. And in that sense, it's a kind of uh, in, uh, sort of empiricist normativism uh, rather than the other way around. Um, and this in that, that sense is distinguishes Stephen's work um, and work of this nature from previous waves of federal um, studies I think in, in the, in the post-Second World War world, um, uh, an earlier generation was very highly formalistic, focusing on um, institutions and classifications. And that was a sort of way that we did comparative federalism at one point. And, then, and this was an approach that sort of eschewed a theory in, a, in, a, in, in quite a big way in, in favor of uh, institutional observation and, and classification. Um, and then we had, after, I think after the, the post-World War World wave of um, and a very tsunami impact of federalism studies that we saw. Um, we, we saw that work uh, very highly characterized by a very thick normativism, uh, particularly thick normativism in favor of um, liberal constitutionalism. Um, and, and of course, uh, that has had mixed and varied success. In some places, it has been very successful in, 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 in getting um, previously authoritarian or, or conflict affected states to some sort of stable federal contract. Uh, but in our, many, very many others, the experience has been mixed. And, and the, the reason for that mixed experience is, of course, the fact that federalism, the acceptance of federalism was presumed to be also conditioned upon the acceptance of a liberal form of constitutionalism. Uh, and this has not always been very successful in, in, in countries where liberalism is not a dominant uh, or an organic tradition. So I think in the, all these ways, Stephen's work is distinctive. Um, it doesn't 
uh, commit the, 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 the errors of either excessive formalism or thick normativism. Uh, and in that sense, I think it promises uh, a lot. Uh, and these are points that have been underscored by both, uh, I think, um, uh, the other panelists before as well in different ways. Now, this work comes at a time, I think, that our world of comparative constitutional law more broadly is changing. Um, certainly the sort of what's, what international relations scholars sometimes call the long American century is certainly coming to an end. Um, uh, and then we are seeing uh, uh, um, uh, an international order of power authority and the legitimacy and prestige of ideas, particularly, becoming much more a multipolar world. Now, this is not to anticipate a world like the, something like the, the old Cold War, where authoritarianism of various forms of non-democratic constitutionalism become equally valid and uh, in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, I certainly am not arguing that it, that it ought to be like that at all. But I think we need to consider the fact that um, the long dominance, uh, the, certainly the post-Cold War dominance of um, uh, fairly close, uh, a, a form of liberal constitutional normativity that was associated with the American experience. Uh, which framed a lot of the development of comparative constitutional law and within it federal constitutional law models um, is pro possibly coming to, 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 to an end. And then we'll need to sort of uh, accommodate uh, a world of um, a, a, a world that is more normatively plural when it comes to um, constitutionalism. And it is in that sense that uh, Books like Stevens or uh, work like Stevens, uh, which focuses on federalism as a type of rule than simply a constitutional form for the state is particularly important because we are actually questioning all those things, not, not merely from the perspective of the accommodation of territorial or democratic, democratically plural polities, but more generally in the world of comparative constitutional law itself. Um, many of the um, the sort of normatively liberal interpretations of the foundational questions of constitutional states. Um, uh, we, have, we are now having an opportunity to revisit uh, many of these things and to see how um, the one level more accommodating and plural with regard to non-liberal traditions, but at, yet at the same time, the serious challenge of ensuring that that's not a simple capitulation to either opportunistic authoritarianism um, or to intolerant forms of um, collective identity, ethnic nationalism, religious intolerance, and so on. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting and challenging time um, to be talking about things uh, like this. Now, Stevens' um, approach to uh, the constitutional management of territorial pluralism along uh, what he calls the federal uh, the, the, the federal theory that he proposed was, demands only the acceptance, an elite acceptance, that the polity that you're dealing with is territorially and therefore democratically dem plural. Um, as long as you make, if you, as a, you, 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 you don't have to, it is not contingent on the acceptance of um, uh, 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 particular views of the self and the state, uh, particular views of constitutional foundings of complete breaks in the past, um, complete breaks between tradition and modernity and all of that. All these liberal assumptions about the foundings of the state and of constitutionalism. You don't need to do that. You don't need you, you, just to act that as a matter of fact. Our polity is territorially plural and we need to do something about it if we are to live in peace and order and with some level of good government. Um, that is all that um, Stevens' theory ex expects and that minimalism is extraordinarily attractive, I think. Uh, and it is also a constitutionalism um, that sort of eschews all of these sort of fancy adjectives like sort of constitutionalism that we have seen proliferating in the past. Um, it, it sees constitutionalism simply as the process uh, of the transformation of raw political authority into legal authority, raw political power into, uh, in, into legal authority. 
um, in, a, in a way that can be, that, that, that is consistent with the traditional meaning and, and particular cultural ecology. And I think that's, again, um, a, a kind of minimalist focus on the core idea of what constitutionalism means um, that's going to play a big role um, in this changing world of comparative constitutional law that we are living in. My third point um, is the following, and that is uh, uh, an issue that I'm particularly concerned with as somebody who's, who, who, who does a lot of work um, in non-Western countries that are grappling with Hindu Hinduism. Uh, most recently in President Sri Lanka. Um, and um, and to um, and um, uh, Myanmar and places like that. Uh, as I said, I mean one of the strengths of, of Stephen's work is, is, is that it minimally accepts elite consensus around the idea that the polity is territorial and plural, and then it then it builds its, its theory of how to do constitutional design and how to run federal governance uh, on those lines. Um, but it is also the thing that is most missing in many of these countries, um, the, the elite acceptance that the, 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 the polity is in fact a territorial plural. Uh, it is the rejection of that by those in charge of the state uh, or, the, uh, or, the, or the absence of a, of a tradition of statecraft um, that, that, that looks at Empirical realism as the way that that that, that you can build um, uh, uh, a style of governance and 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 a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a practice of constitution. It's the very absence of that that makes um, federalism non-acceptable, unacceptable in, in, the, in many of these um, global south places. And that may come from either um, some form of authoritarianism which um, does not believe in, in, in democratic forms of accommodation. It may come from the increasingly sort of talked about uh, you know, uh, forms of uh, association associated with the, the theory of the civilization. Uh, it may come from traditional ethno-nationalism uh, and, and so on. And of course, um, ethnocracy, uh, where procedural democracy is used for in a particular ethnocultural sort of um, a view of the state, um, which uh, sees either the plural polities as hierarchies in which one group dominates or is in charge of the state, um, or, or, or even worse forms of um, enforced acculturation or assimilation. Um, so the issue then for me is that um, the, the, the very sort of Condition exemplar, um, the, the, the condition precedent um, to for for Stevens' theory to do its work for us in politics like that is not there. And how do we get to that is a question that we will have to again in the series that is coming um, that we will have to uh, answer. There are a number of other things, but I think Cheryl would prefer that we we go more to Stephen now. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Sanger. I'm sorry to uh, to draw that. Last very interesting chain of thought to an end, but I'm very anxious to hear from Stephen uh, at this point. So can I now uh, uh, introduce uh, Stephen Tierney, the man uh, much talked about this evening. Uh, Stephen Tierney is of course the author of The Federal Contract. He's a professor of constitutional theory at the University of Edinburgh, and he holds and has held a range of very uh, distinguished uh, positions um, of various kinds. His research interests are in constitutional theory and comparative constitutional law. Uh, and he's the author of a, a number of other very interesting books, uh, including Constitutional Law and National Pluralism and Constitutional Referendums, The Theory and Practice of Republican Deliberation. So Stephen, over to you. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity and I'm, really pleased and humbled by the great um, efforts colleagues have made to read the book. I'd like to begin first though by thanking you, Cheryl, because you know I, I sent you the manuscript and you very kindly read it. Um, obviously, I've been heavily influenced over the years by, by your work, as anyone working in federalism has been. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for your comments on the manuscript and for suggesting this event. And then to Anna, obviously, and as you say, for, for taking it forward through the CCCS. I'm also very grateful to my colleagues, um, four people I greatly respect, and you've offered me a, a real range of very, very rich um, 
comment. I think maybe given that there are a lot of people participating, I'll maybe say a few words just by background um, as to the book, just to fill out what yeah. some of the others have been saying, and in doing so, try to respond to some of these um, very uh, rich comments. I mean, by way of scene setting, you know, why did I, I write the book? And and for some, it seems like an odd topic. You know, so much has been written on federalism. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a massive topic. Loads have been written on federalism in general, federal political systems, comparative federalism. Um, and it's, you know, it's also recognising the proliferation of federalism. But it did strike me that federalism had been strangely neglected by constitutional theory. The way that I've used constitutional theory as a tool in the National Pluralism book and then in the Constitutional Referendums book. Um, and it seemed to me that often federal, the, the very concept of federalism is skirted over quite quickly in books on federalism. So we learn a great deal from those books about the institutional makeup of states, the political dynamics, the economic consequences. But quite often people leave the, if you like, the ontological question to decide what is federalism, or they deal with it in, in quite a cir circular way, whereby federalism comes to be conceptualized through institutions. Um, now, my theory of, of constitutionalism, as Peter and others and Asanga pointed out, is very much a theory, a theoretical approach that's grounded in practice. It is grounded in, in institutions but it's not one that is entirely institutionally led. Um, and what I, I really see constitutional theory as being is, or what I see constitutions as being, is the transformation of political power into legal authority. That's essentially the alchemy that a constitution performs. It takes the, the wildness of the uncontrollability of political power and it transfers it and domesticates it into constitutional rule and legal authority. That's not always a red light thing. It's often a green light thing. It, it therefore facilitates political power to be used in a way, um, but a way that is constricted and controlled. Um, that alchemy depends upon legitimacy in the modern era. That's why we accept constitutions, because what came with the revolutions of the late 18th century was the fundamental idea, and it had been bubbling in other countries as well through the English Civil War and so on. But the idea that fundamentally constitutions should depend on consent. And so it's consent that provides the legitimacy, that provides the the, 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 the transfer, the transformational process from political power. Constitutional theory in the modern era, to my mind, has then moved through um, the French and American Revolution, and largely we, we, we built a lot through the Madisonian style of thinking, to conceive of the modern state constitution in very singular or modest terms. We've, we've looked at this legitimacy source in one sense, in the people. And we can look at the people quite collectively, or we can look at the people individually through a, a very liberal approach to perception of legitimacy. But what we do, whether we're taking those different approaches, is we do it in a very monistic way. We, we think of one state, one constitution, one people. And so much of our normative theorizing and constitutional theorizing has taken place through that process of thinking. And it struck me that, that when we start from a constitutional approach, so let me put it this way, historians and political scientists tend to look at constitutions with the why question. Why did a particular country develop a constitution at a particular time? And why did they adopt that kind of constitution? As a constitutional theorist, I'm more interested in the what question. What was actually done at that moment? What was it that was declared at the moment of foundation to be the normative path, the legal normative path upon which the constitution was built? And it struck me that the federal moment is a foundationally path diverging moment where the constituent power comes into operation at that moment is fundamentally a territorial collective one. Um, so I'm starting from that moment of constitutional authority making, and it's the constitutional territories, whether in fact, and you know, Peter did talk about how I, I am very much led by the historical facts of origins, I am, but what I'm looking at really are foundations rather than origins in a sense. It's the normative, the legal normative foundation and it struck me that federal constitutions, um, when you start to work through the anatomy of modern constitutionalism from the foundational moment, 
constituent power leads to authority, leads to a conception of constitutional subjects, then leads to idea of purposes. Well, why did we do this? Why did we go this way rather than a, a monist generic idea of the people? If you, if you arrive at a federal purpose, then what are the principles behind the federal purpose? And before you know it, you've, you, you've been called upon to rework the entire anatomy of modern constitutional in a federal direction. And that's why when, you know, Eva raises some very interesting points um, about the breadth of the project um, and, um, you know, what, because one thing that I often get asked is, well, what about those constitutional federal systems that are kind of coming together rather than holding together? Or I think Peter talked about Belgium when the, the whole constitution was completely reworked in, in the 1990s. I think for me, what's important at that moment is what has been done constitutionally, what, what is being declared at that particular moment, or what is the nature of that transformation. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm starting not from the sort of sociological perspective of how is a constitution, um, how, how does it relate to the people who are there? I'm starting from this normative approach. What does the constitution declare itself to be and how does that set itself to be? Um, so that's really the, the, what I do in the book. I try to set out in, in chapter three an alternative to a very institutionalist approach, which has been really cir circular to look at constitutions as they've, um, at, look at the institutional architecture of a federal system, often starting with America and then trying to compare every other system to America. And, and essentially to argue, no, we have to start with the self-declaration of each constitution and then work out well, what is generic about the federal system on that basis. And it strikes me that it is a commitment to territorial pluralism. That is not necessarily a commitment to cultural pluralism within territory. Um, it depends on the nature of the, 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 the society itself. Because another thing I argue is that federal constitutions are enormously capacious. The idea of a federal constitu constitution is very open, very wide, um, and, and federal constitutions can manifest themselves in a whole range of ways institutionally. Um, so th those are my, my thoughts really in terms of some of the comments. Even you're fading out a little bit. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> um, Cheryl. Those are my comments. Um, Nick raised some really interesting points about the American system. And whether I, I looked at the New Jersey plan and the, the whole civil war experience, I did have some draft comments that I I'd include in the book. But an apology to my to my commentators, it's already far too long as it is, and, and, and I didn't bother me with more of that. But I can maybe pick that up with Nick later. In a sense, I didn't really see the civil war debates as really deviating from the main focus of what I was saying, and I can explain that to Nick in due course. Finally, people have commented about writing other books. I mean, I hope this is very much the start of the book. I put it out there. I was very nervous about writing this book, to be honest, because Eva Maria kindly said it was radical. Others will see it as heretical. I fully understand that. Um, but I think it's just a starting point. I don't try and deal comparatively with every country. I don't look at countries in a lot of depth. I'm sure people who look at countries in a lot of depth will have a field day pointing out things I've missed and things I've got wrong. Um, so I, I throw myself at, at your mercy on that. Um, I really just wanted this book to start a debate, start a debate about how we need to think about federal constitutionalism in a fundamentally different way from the beginning and build out our anatomy from it. Um, so I'll stop there. I, I've got another couple of things I was going to say about Peter's comments, but I don't want to hog the floor too much. I'll maybe come back to them if people have questions. Uh, OK, thank you very much, Stephen. That's um, fascinating. In fact, I was... Uh, um, a number of the, the panellists and then you yourself have, have, have described the approach you've taken as, as radical uh, or challenging. And I think at one point in the book, you used the term explosive. <laughs> and that was one of the first bits I came to. I thought, wow, this is exciting. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see the, the reception as people's uh, the foundations of their constitutional theoretical beliefs are, are, are challenged. Now, we have actually not terribly long. Um, so can I ask whether members of the panel would like to uh, raise questions um, of Stephen uh, or in relation to each other? And a nice pluralist approach to, to chairing the panel. Yeah, Peter. <laughs> 
Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for your replies, uh, Stephen. Uh, I hope you won't mind if I bring up democraticity again in my question to Asanga this time, because I was fascinated by how we approached uh, a very similar issue from two sides. Uh, myself from the kind of enlightenment political theory side where democracy is a constraint on legitimacy. And you, from your um, work also on uh, global South practices and norms of constitution making, where you seem to have said that what is um, a virtue of the uh, notion of the federal contract is that it does not borrow um, too many of the Western values. Um, which were supplying legitimacy uh, in an earlier day and age. And would you say that democracy is also one of these uh, values uh, where it is a, a virtue of the federal contract not to put too much pressure on this? Or would you say that they go hand in hand and you cannot um, have um, federal constitutionalizations with, uh, without a, a strong democratic intent? Would you like me to come on in on that or? Yeah, I, I think so, Asenga, because uh, we're going to have to wrap up reasonably soon anyway. So if you could respond to Peter and it'll just be another piece of this very rich mosaic that we're discussing. No, absolutely. And, and I hope that we can have this conversation uh, where we can have this at a much longer level, Peter. Uh, thanks very much for raising that. Two, just two very quick points, I think. One is that what I would say is, uh, Comparative constitutional law and federal constitutionalism as a sort of uh, species within it, subspecies within it. <clears throat> so far, certainly after the 1990s, we've taken a particular interpretation of the European Enlightenment, and that's the liberal one, the American and French ones, um, and 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 assumed that that is the that was the meaning of what that watershed meant in terms of ideas of political and constitutional organization. But as people like Gertrude Himmel Farb and others have pointed out, uh, the, the, the European Enlightenment was much more complicated than that. And she calls, for example, the sociology of virtue, uh, which was the British encounter with it, uh, with people like Edmund Burke uh, and so on, um, uh, took away certain other lessons which are, have been entirely submerged. So within the sort of broad Western tradition, um, I think um, this period of flux in comparative constitutional law um, gives us an opportunity to go back to some of the, the submerged thinking and, and see how we can sort of think about authority, order, hierarchy, equality, all of these things in a, in a different way. That's one thing. When we come to the post-colonial and global South world, uh, the point is that we need to expand the ontology of constitutionalism uh, beyond uh, what came after colonialism. Colonial modernity in, in these countries are, are, are a particular thing, and that's a very different kind of modernity from the liberal democratic Ireland of the Western world. Um, and that also, one of the things that also that, that, that does, uh, that, that gives us an opportunity there is to go back to forms of political organization that are there in those countries and their traditions. Now, for example, if you look at the Hindu Buddhist world in there is a whole kind of state form, pre-colonial state form called the, what anthropologists call the galactic polity. Uh, extraordinarily capable of dealing with uh, incredible levels of, of, of pluralism uh, in, a, in a syncretic rather than an either or kind of way. Uh, and, and I think we have neglected some of these traditions uh, that we can resurrect in a new wave of comparative constitutional law um, uh, so that we, I mean, you know, it, it's obviously not, it's not some sort of atavistic call to, to go back to tradition and hierarchy of pre-modern, uh, you know, forms, but, 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 but how we can use history, the ancient constitution, in a way that is consistent with some idea of, 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 of democratic accommodation of territorial pluralism. So I think those two things are the things that I would just say for the moment. Thanks, Asanga. Uh, anyone else have any one last question, I think we probably have time, or one last observation. Um, and I'm afraid, I apologize to the audience, but we won't be able to uh, uh, to draw on your, your questions and ideas, and we're grateful to you for, for thinking about them. Um, anyone else? Stephen, are there uh, final thoughts that you wanted to put on the table? Yeah, just a couple, Cheryl, just to sure. do justice to the contributors. You know, so Ava talked about um, 
the breadth, like what about non-territorialized forms of pluralism or slightly data, so I even go back to the Austro-Hungarian system and then modern Belgium and so on. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a danger, and one of the dangers that I came across was that federalism, if it's cast too broadly, you start to lose a sense of a sort of coherent idea. Um, and I think this is one of the problems that has afflicted it, that it's started to morph into multi-level government debates and so on. So I think obviously, um, you, you know, Eva was talking about my general theory of, of, fed, of constitutional theory and how it's ultimately reflective of society. I think that is my takeaway point on that. Th those countries need not define their constitutions as federal. It might be a particular form of federalism or, or a different or a form of constitutional cultural pluralism. But I think what the modern story of federalism tells us is one that is ineluctably tied to territory. It might be that, that what I'm talking about is territorial federalism. You know, I might have to further define it. But I think that is a discrete story. So Eva's points are very, very important. But it strikes me they're, they're slightly different forms of government. Peter's talk about democracy. I do want to finish on this because it's so important, the democracy point. The book is fundamentally about consent. It's fundamentally about how federal constitutions emerge through processes of consent. But they are territorially differentiated forms of consent or territorially layered levels of consent. That doesn't mean that popular consent itself disappears into a sort of black hole of territory. Um, what I do later in the book is I talk about the, mat the matrix of legitimacy and the matrix of authority in different relationships, including the people directly to the central organ of the state. And so it would make no sense to have territories within a fed modern democratic federal system that themselves are completely debunked of consent systems um, that, would, that would belie the whole original point. So democracy is tied in very, very complex ways throughout the whole system. Um, so from what I understand of the democracy thing, it strikes me that's more of a confederal arrangement, whereas I, I try and, and, and make quite clear that what I'm talking about is a system of territorially layered consent-based um, authority, um, which um, operates hand in hand with what we conceive of as modern democracy. Thank you, Stephen. I mean, one of the many things that you've done with this terrific book is uh, put to bed a whole lot of uh, annoying myths and, and stances in relation to federalism, like the idea that it's a staging post on the way to a unitary system and an imperfect form of state uh, and all of those things. And I actually, it was, it was interesting as I was reading the book, the focus on territory, I mean, of course, I had nagging in the back of my head um, the sorts of observations that people on the panel have also made, but I thought to myself that focus or insistence on territory can be quite useful as well. I mean, if we take the Myanmar context, for example, one of the problems that the discussion on federalism in Myanmar has had is that, well, sure, there are historic territories, but actually they're all mixed all over the country. So if we become federal, uh, is Shan State uh, a constituent unit? or are the Shan wherever they might be, a constituent unit. And, uh, and you know, the latter option is a mess. And it's quite a, quite a relief to be able to say, actually, there's an answer to this. Territory is, is terribly important. And, uh, and I think that your insistence on territory will um, have some downsides because it will exclude certain arrangements, including arrangements involving indigenous people very often. Uh, but it can have its advantages as well. And it'll be really interesting to dwell on these ideas as we go forward. However, we're nearing the witching hour. Um, and so I think we're going to have to bring uh, this to a close. Um, uh, so a series of thanks, uh, Stephen. I hope you feel that your book has been launched um, and, uh, and adequately so. Uh, very many thanks for joining with us to do to do this. Uh, and as we've all said, I suspect this will be the beginning rather than the end of, of a very long and productive conversation on federal constitutional theory and its application. And you are indeed to be congratulated on, on writing such a, a terrific book. To the panelists, all of you, thank you so much for participating in this event. Uh, and for all your insights um, as we get what is likely to be a longer discussion underway. Uh, and many thanks also to my Melbourne Law School CCCS colleagues,
uh, Anna Jedgitz, who did so much to bring this seminar together, and Diana Holland and Angela Henley Boys, who were vital for support um, behind the scenes. And thanks very much to the audience as well. I very much hope you'll join us for future episodes of the Global Seminar. So thanks everyone. For those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, have a lovely day. For the rest <laughs> of us, it's night time. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.